The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen only mode. Hello. Um, looks like we have the broadcast getting started, so we're just getting the slide deck up and ready. So we still have a few more people uh, joining the call, so it'll be just a moment until we get started. Uh, Molly, if you want, wouldn't mind going back one slide when you're ready. All right. Are you able to see the slide deck? Yes, you are up and the first slide is going. So just let me know when you're ready to go, Molly. I'm all ready and I will turn off my camera. All right. Sounds good. Well, thank you everybody uh, for joining us today. It looks like we have uh, quite a few people on the call. Um, my name is Paul Sell. I'm the Reengagement Systems Manager for the Youth Development Division and appreciate you uh, joining us today. Um, so in just a few moments, uh, we're going to go ahead and get things started uh, with some introductions. But before we start those introductions, I want to just take a moment and um, acknowledge uh, our tribal partners and our tribal lands uh, throughout Oregon. So I would first like to acknowledge the many tribes and bands who call Oregon their ancestral territory and honor the ongoing relationship between the land, plants, animals, and people indigenous to this place we now call home. We recognize the continued sovereignty of the nine federally recognized tribes who have ties to this place and the subsequent bands within those tribes and thank them for continuing to teach us how we might all be here together. So as we start the presentation, uh, Molly, would you mind uh, bumping it to the next slide. Perfect. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the Youth Development Director, Brian Fetna, for a few words. Thanks so much, Paul. Uh, welcome, everybody. Again, my name is Brian Detman, and I'm the Youth Development Division Director. I've been on board uh, as director since about August of last year, and I'm excited uh, to be a part of the team in making investments in community um, for really critical youth development work. Uh, first, want to give sincere thanks to the team uh, of grant managers uh, who you'll be hearing from today. Um, Paul Sell introduced himself, Abraham Magana, Jared Shaw, Bill Hansel. You see all their bright and shiny faces on this Friday morning. So I know they're gonna provide some great information. And also Noemi Rios from uh, the Oregon Department of Education and, and Procurement, who's been a critical partner to us in this work and you probably will hear from uh, occasionally and is also the uh, single point of contact on this RFA. Um, I guess I just really quickly also wanna say thanks and an appreciation to all the folks on the call who are doing critical work um, and for youth and families throughout the state. Um, your work to develop um, youth resilience, uh, to help youth address and overcome um, barriers and, and obstacles uh, is critical. And so we're excited to be able to offer the grants that we do to support the critical work you're doing. We can't um support every program um but i know many of you out there are uh, grantees um and so we welcome you back and and for those who are new um we also uh really say thank you for being a part of the work you know doing the critical work that you're doing and also just for being a part of this session um to, maybe to learn more about the investment grant um investment grant making that we do in communities so with that, I'll turn it back over to you, Paul. Thanks so much. I'm going to go off screen, but I will be here um, listening and look forward to the information this morning. Thanks so much. Absolutely. Thank you, Brian, uh, for those for those words. I'll uh, go ahead and uh, Abe, if you wouldn't mind uh, starting the introductions, would be great. Yeah. Uh, my name is uh, Abraham Magana. I'm the Youth Community Investment Grant Manager. Uh, I'll be going with you. Uh, this presentation, the majority presentation with uh, my fellow colleagues here. 
and I'll go ahead and pass it off to Molly. All right, it looks like Molly may be having some technical difficulties. She's behind uh, the scenes, yeah, she's behind the this. electronic part of this presentation. So um, I will reach out to her, but um, Jared, do you mind giving a brief introduction? Sure, good morning, everybody. My name is Jared Shaw. I am a grant manager for various um, different types of grants, community investment, re-engagement, um, and also workforce policy analyst for YDD. I'll turn it over to Bill. Good morning, all, and welcome. Um, I'm Bill Hansel, Youth Policy Analyst with Youth Development Division. I wear a couple different hats. I am the data guy um, and also a grant manager, uh, among, among some other things, and look forward to sharing with you about our uh, community investment grants. And I'll pass it to Noemi. Good morning, everyone. My name is Noemi Rios, and as Brian mentioned, I am the procurement and contract specialist on this grant opportunity and the single point of contact. So if you have questions um, after this presentation, you'll need to email me the questions so that we can compile all the questions and respond to them in a single document. Um, that document will be posted on the YDD website and also on ORPIN, which is the Oregon Procurement Information Network. Uh, just to let you know, ORPIN will be going through a blackout phase in June. It will be read only, but we'll still be able to post some information. However, the YDD website will be the uh, main source of information for this grant opportunity. All right, back to Paul. All right, thank you all for those introductions. And I think Molly might be having some technical difficulties behind the scenes, but she's uh, giving me a thumbs up that I think the slide projection is working. So we'll go ahead and stick with that. Molly Burns is a uh, grant manager for us as well and works on the re-engagement team on that. So, um, so as you can see down there on the bottom, um, we are going to be trying to answer the questions uh, as best we can uh, throughout this piece and then the official uh, RFA documents as well as the Q&A. Uh, document that will be published uh, later or early July will be um, put onto the youth development website. Molly, if you wouldn't mind, please uh, bumping it to the next slide. All right, so I'm going to be um, turning my camera off here shortly because I will be managing the chat and the questions behind that. But you'll notice that this presentation, all participants have been muted. You also don't, uh, as participants, don't have access to your video cam. Um, and so please don't, you don't have to worry about trying to get on camera or not. So you'll see us kind of bounce back and forth uh, depending on who's talking. So for the information webinar, if you can just please put your questions or comments into the question box. And like I said, I'll be behind the scenes trying to address those as we go through on that. Um, there are some questions that may require some follow-up, and so those would be provided in the Q&A document, and I'll note that in the, in the chat box as we go through. Um, there also are some screenshots of application materials throughout, which Abel point out. Uh, and with that, um, I will go ahead and turn my camera off and turn it back to Abe. I'll see you later in the presentation. All right. Just before we get started, I also want to remind you, if you have a split screen uh, kind of have multiple uh see us in three or four different boxes and have a presentation screen in one of the boxes i want to make it full screen go ahead and move your cursor to the bottom right of that slide and you should see a couple arrows diagonal arrows click on it and it should make it full screen all right uh, next slide please so we'll go ahead and start here with this screen you've probably seen before in some of our previous presentations, but there's our vision. Um, all of Oregon's youth have the opportunity to thrive and achieve their full potential. Our mission, uh, YDC, YD Aligned Systems, invest in communities, ensures equitable and effective services for youth ages 6 through 24 throughout Oregon and the tribal nation, supporting educational and career success, disrupt youth crime and violence, and affirm youth strengths and safety. Our values there below, equitable access, equal opportunity, youth-centered approaches and results, inclusion and innovation. Slide five, please. So there's a little bit more about the council and the division. Uh, the YUD uh, is the agency that carries out the work under the strategic direction of the council. Uh, here's some of our initiatives uh, overall as an agency and council. 
uh, community investment and engagement grant making, which is what we'll be talking about today, specifically the community investment, uh, juvenile crime prevention grant making, uh, compliance and monitoring for juvenile protections under the juvenile justice, uh, JJDPA, trying to remember the, the Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Act, that's what it is. Uh, implementation of a youth re-engagement system as part of the Student Success Act. Our funding priorities are below. Identifying and removing system barriers, gaps, reducing disparities, achieving equitable outcomes, building assets, protective factors, strength-based practices for youth, engage, re-engage, and advance youth learners, and preventing and disrupting crime, violence, and promoting safety for youth. Next slide. So here is kind of what we'll be talking about today, our youth grants portfolio, specifically our youth community investment grants. Now, I want to make sure that you understand that our grant is the youth community investments, and it's kind of the overarching grant that oversees the initiatives within that grant. Uh, so here you have the youth violence and gang prevention, which was previously called or currently, if you have one of our grants, the youth and gangs grant. Next, you have the youth solutions initiative. Uh, that's a newer one. We used to have something similar a few biennia ago, uh, which was uh, an innovation grant. It's similar to what that was in the past. Uh, then we have the Youth Promise Initiative, and some of you may have known it as a Youth and Community Grant, which you may have now. And we kind of used Youth Promise to distinguish it from, you know, what the Community Investment Grant is. Kind of try to clarify that. So the Youth Promise Grant, I'm sorry, Youth Promise Initiative, and then we have the Youth Workforce Readiness Initiative, which some of you may know as a Youth Workforce Grant currently. Now here we'll cover some of the burning questions. So when did the RFA application close? You'll see there Tuesday, July 13th at 1 p.m. You'll be required to submit that through our SM Apply uh, system, which we'll get into in a little bit. Yes, can my organization submit more than one application? Yes, you can. Uh, you can do multiple applications for either the re-engagement grant and or the community investment grants. But keep in mind also within the community investment grants, you can do multiple across different initiatives as well. But it will depend kind of on the programmatic needs and the youth you're serving, where they're serving. You have to be able to distinguish the differences between the grants and or the grant initiatives within the community investment grant. What is required to submit the first claim for this grant? You'll, you'll have to sign your grant agreement first, get that executed. Then you'll have to have all your EGIMS, which is our electronic grant management system, processes and approvals complete. Basically, you have to have all the paperwork submitted and approved. Then you'll also have to have your first deliverable, which will be an approved work plan submitted to us. The next question, when will expenditures be reimbursable back to? So our intent is to have it uh, cost reimbursable all the way back to July 1st, 2021. Uh, that's currently pending YDC approval here in June. Uh, so keep an eye on that. You can actually find that information through our website uh, and also through our um, video site, our YouTube site, which can, you can be accessed through our website as well. How does two, I should say, how do organizations receive funds for YDD grant funds? Uh, again, it's reimbursement based. Uh, you basically have to submit a request uh, through our uh, reporting system and EGAMS. Uh, something that's new this cycle though, is that you will be able to do these reimbursement, these requests on a monthly basis. So that's new, that hasn't happened in the past. So that's something I think that, I think some of our grantees will really, I hope take advantage of. And if you have other questions, how do you ask them uh, during the presentation? Again, in the chat box, go ahead and type them in there. Most of them will probably be answered when we switch at least live here verbally, uh, when we switch from one presenter to another. And I hope we can get most of them through at the end of the presentation. Um, after this presentation is over, any and all questions will need to be submitted to our uh, sole point of contact, uh, which is Noemi Rios on this call. Um, and her information can be found on the first page of the RFA for community investments. And we hope that the, um, the official responses and questions from this presentation will be published on or around July 2nd, 2021. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, it'll be on our website, that information, it'll probably go out as well uh, through um, an email. On to slide eight. So youth community investment grants. Again, this is kind of the overarching grant for our initiatives, right? The age range is six to 24, and it varies according to the initiative as well as the award range, 20,000 to 200,000. Again, varies between, according to the um, grant initiative. Uh, the purpose, you can see this actually in our RFA. These next few slides are actually completely lifted off from our RFA, the language. Um, 
like I mentioned before, the community investment grants are collectively known as the grant initiatives. Uh, serving youth 6 to 24 at risk of disengaging from school or work, uh, expected to be culturally responsive, uh, sexual and gender identity affirming, address various barriers to educational and workforce success. And right there, we have the initiatives that I spoke about earlier. Go ahead to slide nine. Youth Promise Initiative. The age range is 6 to 24, award range between 100,000 and 200,000. Like I mentioned before, this used to be called the Youth and Community Grant. Uh, there's been a tweak now. If you look here on the description, uh, still 6 to 24, but it's for existing programs and services. So for example, if you, if you receive, for example, you had a program, you've been doing this type of work or services, and you would apply for this grant. This isn't intended for new programming or new services. Um, the types of services uh, may include, but are not limited to mentoring, mental health supports, culturally specific, after school activities, pro-social activities, burial removal, and positive relationships. A note, some of this grant is partially funded through our Title 20 funds as well, which puts, uh, may have different age ranges. Next slide. Our Youth Workforce Readiness Initiative, which used to be called our Youth Workforce Grant. Age range is 14 to 24. Award range is between 100,000 and 200,000. Again, supports existing community efforts to directly provide youth ages 14 to 24 with career exploration and skill development services that lead to sustainable living wage um, work opportunities. Milos, again, a listing of the types of uh, uh, services and programming that we support, career connected learning, internships, apprenticeships, soft skill development, entrepreneurship programming, workforce reentry services for youth involved in justice system, and career mentoring counseling to ensure that youth have the tools they need to access employment and thrive in their careers, chosen careers. Now here we have our Youth Solutions Initiative, age range six to 24, the award there 20, between 20,000 and 100,000, uh, support to you at six to 24. And this can actually, this is intended for new programming or scaling up or something innovative that's happening. Uh, you'll see below there some of the uh, examples of program services that are new, innovative, scaling up, like I just mentioned. Uh, trying to do some systems levels work, um, middle school age workforce career exposure, delivery of mental health and or drug alcohol treatment services, homeless support, um, restorative justice practices. So these might be those type of programs that may not be, uh, may not serve individual youth, for example, but a systems level work is just an example um, that may not fit uh, into the other grant requirements. Um, so that's something new, perhaps. Next slide. Youth Violence and Gang Prevention uh, Initiative. So this used to be called the Youth and Gangs Grant before. Uh, there you have age range 12 to 24, award range between 50,000 and 100,000. And the Youth Violence and Gang Prevention Initiative prevents and supports youth ages 12 to 24 at risk of committing or being victims of violent crime. Services related to this grant uh, address factors that expose youth to violent or criminal gang activity. And below is kind of a list of the services uh, included, but not limited to reentry services, community outreach, trauma informed mental health supports, pro social activities, mentoring, and the creation of positive safe spaces for our youth. Now we'll go on to the kind of what the online application process looks like. Uh, again, you can see that in RFA section 2.4.5. Uh, to access our application, there's a website, uh, OregonYouth.SMApply.io. Once you go there, you'll see the screen on the right, uh, which is kind of the landing screen there, where at the top right, you'll see login and register. If you've already had an account with us, you can go ahead and log in, or if you don't, you would click on the green button there that says register, and that'll take you into a series of screens that get you set up uh, where you have to put your name and email and so on. Now here, this is what the application screen, they've got a lot going on here. So I'll move, kind of point you out to the left. So once you've logged in, what you will see is the two programs there, which are the two grants that we have available currently that are open. Uh, you see there'll be two choices, Youth Community Investment Grants and the Re-Engagement Grants. And you'll be able to click on either one, go in there. On this, and then the next screen on top of that one is what you see if you click on the Youth Community Investment Grants choice. 
what you'll see is a definition of youth community investment grants followed by the, uh, the description of, uh, I'm sorry, description of the youth community investment grants followed by the description of the various initiatives, right? And you have, in this screen, you also have the opportunity to download it. If you click download, a little hyperlink, click on it, you can download it for reference at any time. And then and after you see the green apply button, you click on the green apply button, it takes you now to the actual application tasks that you have to undergo. Uh, for the community investment grant, you'll be, uh, you'll have to go through three tasks to basically submit your grant application. Uh, very important that you first read the instructions there. You see I have them circled. This is the screen you'll see once you've gone through. The instructions will pretty much tell you there's three tasks you have to go through, um, what you have to complete, and how you navigate through the various tasks in the screens. Next slide, please. Now I'll give you a couple of hints here once you kind of get into applying for the grant, um, I'm sorry, through the application process and SM apply. So all the links uh, have an underlying text um, and you'll know you'll be able to, anything that is hyperlinked, if you move your cursor over the word, it will turn into kind of like a little hand that points. You click that hand, it'll open that hyperlink up in another tab. Um, you can copy and paste uh, from any of your word processing programs uh, from Word, uh, a lot of people will do their applications in Word first. So copy all the questions that are in RFA or through the SM Apply and do it there. I just want to warn you that there are word counts associated and we'll get into that a little bit. You can also use a scroll function at the right of your screen to move the windows up and down. And this is important. I think I know early on we used to get uh, phone calls right through our SPC about, oh, I'm not seeing the green button. I can't move to next. And oftentimes all you have to do is just kind of scroll down and then the button would appear. Uh, we realize people are doing this on different screens and things of that nature. So, and then what you'll also see when you're in your application uh, on the left is a navigation box. And that's what you see there on the right there where it says eligibility to apply. There's a check mark. That green check mark means that you've completed that first task or that task. Uh, when you see a circle with half green and half white there transparent, that means that you've started that task, but you have made, you have not completed it yet. Uh, and again, there'll be three tasks to complete in community investment grant. Next slide. So now eligibility, the, the first task you're going to see is really to determine your eligibility. Um, and so what you'll see is believe really, the screen on the right, you literally have to just click on something. Are you a nonprofit organization? Are you a faith based public benefit company, mutual benefit, county, city or city government entity? A federally recognized tribe, right? Um, and that will move you up to the next. There is a none of the above, but if you are, if you click on none of the above, you will not be eligible. Just to let you know. Uh, for the eligibility task one, uh, we're going to ask you to ensure that you're actually serving youth. So that's what this is, and actually is divided into different uh, age ranges there. And if you have questions in our RFA again. We actually have youth defined as to what it means for our agency and the purposes of this grant, along with some other definitions there also that you may want to pay attention to. So there, um, yeah, you just select one of these options. Next slide. Now verification requirements. Uh, excuse me. I think actually I was supposed to go to uh, Bill. I'm sorry, Bill. I apologize. No, it's it's quite all right. I don't mind you presenting uh, my slides for me. So, uh, Will, nice you, job. Before we start, is there a question, Paul, that you may want to share before we move on? And I pass it to Bill. Sorry, I had to unmute myself there. Uh, I think I'm coming back on camera. All right. Um, so I'm trying to go through each of the questions. I think uh, right now there isn't, they're pretty broad. So if we can continue on and then I'll try to address some of those here shortly. But if you have asked questions in uh, the question section, please do take a look at the responses that are being uh, entered in throughout this presentation. Bill, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you. Um... So on this page, um, and as um, the, the task before, this is really about eligibility and determination for, um, for the grant structures. Um, 
and basically one of the distinctions between youth promise and youth solutions is an agency's or programs or projects ability to uh, collect and report individual level data. Um, so if you're a system wide uh, program or um, intervention or delivering something on a on a school level intervention, um, i.e. something that that uh, does not lend itself to collect individual level data, um, you will um, be limited to the youth solutions award. Um, so this screen is basically asking you to uh, attest that you understand the requirements around uh, being able to collect and report individual level data um, um, and um, also the um, eligibility that if you're unable to do that, then Use Solutions is, is the default um, grant uh, for your program. So in relation um, to some of our uh, grants from last year, if you were a site level, school level, system level um, change, that this will be new. Um, depending on your ability to collect and provide individual level data will determine whether or not you're a Youth Promise or a Youth Solutions uh, grantee. Um, our reports include a, a, a quarterly reporting of a narrative data and expenditure report. The narrative report is uh, the opportunity to, to tell uh, your story and your voice for your program. Um, we're we're um, going to emphasize the narrative reports this biennium as um, as really uh, the the opportunity to do something um, that is really emphasizing the the project's uh, voice and and ability to tell the story that uh, may not be um, entirely represented in the data. The data report is um, really allows us to do um, uh, analysis and to report out on the impact that our programs are having. Um, and uh, again, depending on your grant um, will, uh, or the, the initiative will um, depend on what that data report will look like, but uh, certainly um, some individual level uh, data and outcomes. And then the expenditure report captures your request for reimbursement. Um, and we're excited this year that as part of the expenditure report in previous bienniums, it has been available only quarterly. Because it is reimbursement based, that means you would have to be able to cover at least three months of, of, of work before you're eligible for um, requesting reimbursement for cost incurred during that reporting period. Um, and now um, we're going to be able to implement a uh, still reimbursement based. So um, at a minimum, it, it's reduced from three months to a month. And then after the end of that month, you're able to uh, request reimbursement for work done in the previous month. And that will be incorporated into the expenditure report. Um, and it doesn't, it, um, these are uh, also available for one-offs. So because you choose to um, request funds for, for one month doesn't mean you have to do that continuously throughout the lifespan of the grant. Um, the, the expenditure report will be built such that if you do a one month, it, it will be reflected. And then you could say um, in the second month of the biennium claim for the first month, and then not claim again until the quarterly reporting is due. and you know, maybe some uh, unexpected ex expenses occur again in, you know, quarter five, you could do a monthly request in quarter five as well and no other time during the biennium. So uh, we're hoping that that will improve uh, flexibility the, and our, our ability to help meet um, uh, costs associated with the grant um, earlier than, than the three months uh, first biennium. I believe we're back to Abe. Yes. Uh, so now I'm going to go ahead and kind of the eligibility confirmation and the completion of task one. Again, you have many screens here. So one of the last questions that you'll get at this in the completion of task one is basically that you understood everything you kind of checked off prior um, and you're affirming that you do. Once you've done that, you'll know if you're eligible to apply for the community investments grant. What you want to do after that is kind of hit the mark complete, mark as complete. 
And what will happen then, you'll see on your left taskbar menu, which I have circled here, you'll see a whole new task appear. Uh, that's your second task that you'll have to complete. Uh, so what you'll do there is click on that. When you move your mouse over it, it'll have a line under it, and it'll, you click on it, and then you'll begin the next process or the next task to start your application. So again, now on to task two, you'll be asked uh, to fill out some of your uh, organizational information, business address, service address, the, count, the counties where you're serving a youth, um, or if it's a different, uh, your business address from, from your service address, uh, program personnel information, executive director, program manager, fiscal manager, and the primary uh, point of contact for the application. Uh, initiative eligibility. So what this is, and this again is directly lifted off the eligibility there on the right, uh, the RFA, uh, depending on which one you pick, will tell you which initiative you're eligible to apply to. And it'll go specifically into that specific questions for that grant initiative. Um, so really depending, and you'll know, you can click on any one of them and you'll see at the very bottom of your screen, it'll change. So right there where I have served youth ages six to 24 with program services that focus on improving life, career and educational outcomes for youth. If you select that one, you'll scroll down and you say, oh, you're eligible for youth solution. Then it'll change depending on each one of those. And you would click next after you've completed that, the bottom green, bu the green button at the bottom right. Next, you have the application narrative, which is the actual questions. Um, you'll have to submit a response to all six questions um, and address any sub bullets as well. So uh, the question is completely answered. Um, there are word counts for each of the questions. So you gotta be cognizant of not going over that word count. Uh, and for all the grant initiatives, except the youth solution and the youth violence and gang prevention, the applicant should use definitive terms in a sense, right? Describing what you will do, right? Except for hopes, expects, intends, plans, right? Now that's the distinction because youth solutions, like I said, is for something new or innovative, something that may have not been done yet. And youth violence and gang prevention really is to address anything that may be, for example, currently uh, rates of violence uh, have been going, have been spiking. So those things kind of have been flow. So be able to address those types of things and using the appropriate uh, services uh, for that. Another thing I want to mention, we also have it set up. So you have to actually fill out each question before you can progress further onto another screen. Once you've completed all the questions, you can actually navigate forward and back between the task screens. So you have to fill in those uh, questions to be able to move forward and back. And in general, for all the other tasks, to be able to move within the task forward and back, you have to have answered the questions or filled out or checked the box. Just want to put that out there. Here are the different evaluation items. Uh, the youth population, you have 400 word limit, 80 points. Evaluation item two, program services and activities. Uh, then you have, which is a hundred point item three evaluation, the service area, where 300 word limit, 40 points, equity and voice, 400 word limit, 80 point partnerships, 350 word limit, 60 points. And finally, organization description. So you can kind of see how things are weighed there a little bit. Next. So this is an example of what the question may look like. Uh, this, is the, this is the one, number one, but all the questions have this format, right? This template, right? This one's specific to youth population being served, right? So again, I wanna remind you to address everything in the questions. Uh, it might be a good idea to review the rubric in your RFA uh, because the scoring is dependent on completeness of answering your questions and addressing everything that's being asked in the question. Uh, again, you can move the, there's a task box on the bottom. So that's not a very big space for questions. So there, if you click on the bottom right, you can actually click and drag that out and make the text box bigger. Again, I want to remind also, you can also copy and paste from a word processing, whether it be Word or WordPerfect into here. What you can't put in there though are colors. You can't put graphs. You can't put pictures, uh, tables. If you have an Excel table, you can't put that in there either. Mostly just, just text, just Word text. Simple text. Um, go on to the next slide. I think Jared, you're up next. 
Yeah. Is there any questions? Uh, I'm sorry, Paul. Yes, yeah, so I was going to pause just for a second, if we can. Okay. Um, and so I flagged a few of the questions, um, some questions around the data part that I think would be kind of important to address. And Bill, I believe you were covering some of that work. Okay. Um, yes. So one of the first questions is, do we, do you anticipate the data report will be the same or similar as the current reporting? Um, it will be substantially similar. Um, so like um, if you're familiar with that data report, that does provide good examples of what individual level data means like gender, race, ethnicity, um, specific outcomes that may be relevant to your programming. Like, um, I, you know, if, if uh, hypothetically you're a after school reading program, you may do a pre-test and a post-test and, and so you, um, we'll figure out a way to to report that. Um, we'll, we'll we have flexibility to to um, customize some of these fields around uh, relevance to your programming. Um, but the critical thing is it, it, in terms of the use solutions versus the other categories of grants is this notion of, uh, for example, if you if if um, there are some programs that may run a socioeconomic need uh, or, or social like a free lunch program, right, or an outreach program to uh, uh, houseless youth uh, type of thing that that is may not actually collect data on the individual participants, uh, but instead collect the count of lunches distributed or contacts or or something like that at that level um it's not individual level data at that point um and so that would that's um uh, for example maybe a, um, a train the trainers program uh type of thing if you're offering services to train up teachers in a uh, certain evidence-based classroom model um, your your level of intervention is at the classroom level, not at the not at the individual level. And if you don't have the data at the individual level, that means you're a, uh, a candidate for use solutions. Thank you, Bill. Um, there was quite a few questions around the data piece, so I think you covered actually quite a few of them. Um, and so I'll go ahead and turn it back to Abe, and then we'll continue to address them in the chat. Oh, excuse me. One other note. I apologize. One of the responses I put in this wrong, incorrect, tiny box. So if it, there is a correction in there, so note that it does not allow me to erase the original response. So uh, with that, I will turn it back to Abe. Okay, I'll turn it to Jared. Jared's on. Oh, apologize. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so the next part of task two will be uh, to upload your projected budget. Now, this is not a scored part of the application. It's not an evaluation item, but it is still required, uh, obviously, so we know how much you're requesting and what we're working with here. So when you go to the website, uh, this will be listed as attachment D uh, when you're on the web page that shows our RFA. And so you'll download the budget. Uh, pretty straightforward, but a few things to note on this page. You'll fill out at the top your organization name and your project title. And then you'll see the box here, amount requested. That's going to be the total amount that you're requesting for your project. Uh, you'll fill out the different line items. And then one thing to note and to be aware of is that at the bottom, you'll see total budget. That will calculate automatically as you're filling out all the different line items. And at the end, that must equal the amount requested at the top. If it doesn't, that, that box is gonna turn red, and that means that it's not um, the same as the amount requested, and so you just need to go back and fix that and make sure that those align. The other thing to pay attention to on this page is the grantee administrative costs line. Um, so you'll see in the note below, administrative costs may not exceed 15% of the total budget or your federally negotiated indirect rate, whichever is more. So unless you have a federally negotiated indirect rate that's higher than 15%, um, that box there, when you enter your admin costs, you'll see the gray box to the right of it. That will show up as a percentage that will calculate automatically what the admin costs, the percent of admin out of the total budget. And that should be 15% or lower. Um, if you have a, an indirect rate, a federally negotiated indirect rate higher than 15%, and that's what you're gonna use for your admin costs, That'll turn red if it's over 15%, and that's okay. 
you'll just need to submit uh, supporting documentation to show that that's the case, that you have that higher federal indirect rate. Uh, but otherwise, that box should be 15% or less and will uh, be green. So just check those things before you submit your budget and make sure that everything lines up. And then also you'll see when you download the workbook that it's a couple different tabs. If you look down at the bottom here, you'll see we're on the grant budget tab. To the left of that, you'll see category definitions. Um, and that will be the next slide, if we could go to that. So if you um, take a look at the category definitions page, please look at that before you start filling out those line items. That's gonna show you exactly where everything falls. So it's a description of what each line item is. And that'll help you determine where to put, uh, where to allocate your expenses. We get a lot of questions, for instance, on what constitutes supplies and materials versus equipment. So just read through this before you uh, go in to create your budget, and hopefully there will be some helpful hints there about uh, where things should be allocated. Next slide, please. Uh, and the next part of the budget will be the budget narrative. Pretty simple. It is what it what it sounds like. We're just asking for a description of your budget. Um, that can just be a simple bullet point for each line item, just a description of how you arrived at those expenses, what they'll be used for, um, and just what those, what those costs will entail. Uh, next slide, please. And then the final step there will be the executive summary. Uh, quick executive summary, 50 word limit, really just your elevator speech for what your program is. And then we're asking for an application title, uh, which is limited to eight words. That's just a very short, clean title uh, for your application. And you'll hit mark as complete in that green button. And next slide, please. So as Abe mentioned earlier, when you hit mark as complete, that third task will show up. So make sure you scroll back up to that pane on the left, that column there. And you'll now see that review and submit grant application is available. Um, your application is not submitted until you have gone through this process. So click on task three, review and submit grant application. You'll see on the right, it'll prompt you to review your application. Um, it'll ask for, oops, I think I, I shrunk the screen on my end. <laughs> um, it'll ask you to sign and review and submit. Um, so you'll hit mark as complete. But also be aware this is important when you hit mark as complete on this step it's still not submitted you can see at the bottom here of this column uh, the submit button which is in gray that will turn green once you've hit mar um, mark as complete on this screen and then you have to go back and hit the green submit button which will then prompt you to confirm everything and you'll hit submit one final time and you'll receive a confirmation that it's been submitted so just be very careful that you are actually hitting submit um, before you've yeah, that's the that's how you'll know your application has been submitted. <laughs> Next slide, please. So once those applications come in, this is just a review of how they'll be scored. Um, so we have those six questions that will be evaluated. They will go to review panels, um, and each person on the panel will rate each question uh, with a score of zero through four, zero being lowest, four being highest. And you can see there's a weight associated with each question and there will be a calculation done with the score and the weight to arrive at the certain number of points per question. Obviously those points added up will be the total points. Uh, next slide, please. And so it says here the final application score is that average score determined by the sum of all evaluators weighted scores divided by the total number of evaluators per application. So once that happens, it'll move into a two-stage process of awards. The first is that um, the highest scored application that meets the minimum score requirement per region will be awarded a grant. There are 11 regions, and we'll get into that a little bit um, on the next slide. But what we've done for this grant is we've uh, divided the state into 11 regions based on what's called the regional solutions map from the governor's office. And this is really just to increase the geographic distribution of grants across the state. That's the only reason. Um, and so there are the 11 uh, regions where grants will be sorted and the highest ranking uh, application from each of those regions will be awarded. Once that is done, the rest of the applications will move into um, one competitive pool that's no longer based on the regions and that ranking process and awarding process will continue. Um, you can see the note down here. 
and gang prevention is not included in that regional ranking or award, but the rest of the initiatives will be. Uh, next slide, please. So this is that map that we're talking about. Um, and we've got the 11 different regions here listed on the left that you can see. And so the way you'll be assigned, um, the applications will be assigned based on an established business address. However, if your business address is different from the region where you'll be providing service, you can petition to have your application counted in a different region or in the region where you're providing service. Uh, you would do that by submitting supporting documentation to the single point of contact as outlined in section 3.4.1 of the RFA. So if you know that that's gonna be the case for you where your business address is different from your area of service, um, review that, uh, that section of the RFA uh, for instructions on submitting that petition. Um, and those requests to change your regions have to be received no later than close of RFA, so July 13th. Um, next slide, please. And this is just what you'll see in SM Apply, which will ask you where your proposed services are taking place, um, if it's the same county as your business address. If you hit yes, um, those different those county drop boxes will disappear. If you hit no, uh, you can go down and select the counties where you're providing service. And then um, on the right, you'll see the check the box below if your organization service location is different, uh, is also your business address. And if you check that, it'll fill in your address there and you're good to go. And I will turn it back over to, I believe, Abe or Paul. Abe, hey, you're on mute. Um, I believe I'm back on, correct. All right. Anymore. All right, there we go. Yes, so here's kind of our timeline. As you can see there, there's today, the Q&A session, when the request for clarifications are due is uh, Friday, June 25th there, 1 p.m. Answers to questions, to request for clarification, for clarification issued approximately Friday, July 2nd. Uh, closing applications due Tuesday, July 13th, 2021 at 1 p.m. Make sure your grant application is submitted. Um, there's a difference between clicking complete, it means you've completed filling out the application versus pushing the green submit button, which means you've submitted the application. So make sure you hit that green submit button at the very end. Uh, the request to change region, you have till Tuesday, July 13th at one o'clock as well. And then you'll see there when uh, we uh, will issue the notice of intent to award. Uh, we're looking at approximately Friday, August 27th, 2021. And then there is a focus period there at the end, uh, seven calendar days after the notice of intent to award. All right, thank you, Abe. So we do have quite a few questions in the chat. Um, just kind of a time check for everybody. We are about um, 11.18 and we're scheduled to 11.30. So I'll kind of go through the questions quickly for the ones that have yet to be answered. If you did submit one, please do kind of scroll back and see those with an interest of time. If we have time to come back and answer those ones that were answered, um, we will uh, do that uh, verbally as well. So um, scrolling down and I'll kind of let you, I'll try to direct the questions to those that um, kind of talked about those. Um, Abe, I believe this is yours. Our organization will be applying for a grant renewal. Our programs are in restore are in restorative justice. However, since these are existing programs and services, am I correct in assuming that I should apply under the Youth Promise Initiative? If according to what kind of the needs are currently of the youth and the type of programming that exists, yes, you can apply to the youth that one specifically as if is an existing program. There's nothing that says you can't. Um, so the answer for that one is yes, you can do that. Perfect. Um, so Paul, uh, I, other, I was gonna say, yeah, if any I, other colleagues wanna jump in and provide any other further clarification, please feel free. Okay, and that's what I'd like to do. So um, just to clarify, the Youth Solutions is not exclusively for new programming. You can be a new programming and program, and if you are, the solutions is really about um, potentially uh, for the new grantees, new programming capacity building. And so oftentimes um, the data collection mechanisms and stuff like that are not yet set up um, for new programs. Um, we don't want to exclude new programming from that, from our grant portfolio because of, of 
of some of you know some of those restrictions and in fact we would like to be able to assist and help programs that are looking to expand and build capacity around um, uh, around that area um, so within the solutions also is um, the the flexibility to present aggregate level data um, or design a data collection tool that is appropriate for the type of programming you're doing the others require individual level data um, and that could be both point in time or longitudinal um, it, as long as it's individual level data so for the you know one program that's more shelter care based that that point in time collection is is um, a valid individual level data for other programs that may be longitudinal because you're tracking them um, over time but just to be clear you can be an existing program that serves um, a um, again an aggregate level or site level or a larger level don't have the ability to drill down to individual level data even though you're existing you're eligible um, for solutions if you can't provide individual level data you're not eligible for the other grants thank you bill um, for that some of that clarification and i think one of the big one of the other questions i've seen quite a bit is around providing a sample report and i am i'm doing some checking behind the scenes on that so that will be something that will have to be addressed i believe unless one of you know more about that than i do a sample data report okay we'll have get back to them on that okay sounds good we will get back to you on those uh, options uh, there's a question here would the youth solutions grant program support a set, um, evaluation research activity to implement and assess the effectiveness of a new approach to address youth concerns um, I think that I don't know if one of you can uh, speak more to that but that may be one of the questions that we'll have to learn more individually I think I don't know if you have anything to say, Bill, about that one. So um, some of these will are are potential. Um, there, it's but it's a big question, and there's a lot we need to know. So if if um, it sounds like if if this is some type of evaluation study, um, it, the it may be harder to justify how that is serving youth. Um, um, it, it's not to say it's a valid uh, uh, you know a thing to pursue. But um, the, the link here for all of our grants is that, you're, that, that it somehow reflects providing services uh, to youth that improve uh, the, the outcomes uh, for these youth. So, so that's kind of where I would point uh, in that. It, I can't definitively say one way or the other, but if it's just purely a research study, um, I, would, I would question if that, that will meet uh, the requirements. Thank you, Bill. Um, so I'm continuing to go through. I apologize for me turning my head away from this camera. I'm using three screens currently, so I'm kind of moving between them. Um, getting to the next question here. Um, and Jared, you might be able to speak more to this, and it may have already been answered, but will there only be one grant allocated per region to the highest scoring bidder? So the way it will work, so no, not necessarily. What, what will happen is if we receive five grants, five applications from um, a region, um, the way it will work is that all grants first will be sorted into the regions in which they, their, either their business address is or where they're requesting, um, if they've petitioned to have it uh, counted where their service region is. And then in each region that has applications, the highest uh, scored in that region will be awarded. The rest then move into a competitive pool, um, for which, including all applications across the state. So there are others in those regions that could also be awarded, but um, it's just to, to, to ensure that at least one, um, that highest scoring one, is awarded per region. Does that make sense? Thank you, Jared, for clarifying that. Um, um, make a yeah. Yes. The, Sorry. It's just violence and gang prevention one is excluded from that first part of the they're not placed in regions, those grants. Yeah. Um, and then, uh, Bill, you might be able to speak a little bit to this uh, just to clarify 
uh, youth promises for existing programs and youth solutions is for new programs. What if you have an existing program that does not have a method to collect individual level data? So maybe a little bit more clarification on individual data and then um, how we might be able to adjust that. So on the surface, um, that question is a great one. It, it um, as an example, that would mean um, youth solutions. Um, However, if, um, if it's a matter of, um, again, the, the, this is one of the things we're working on internally too, because this is new, this biennium. Um, and what we're trying to do is create a category for our grantees that have, um, and rightly so, limitations or, you know, because of the style of, of intervention or, or the, um, again, it, if um, sometimes we're seeing the emergence of uh, say, uh, citywide, um, bringing all youth serving agencies together to, uh, you know, form some type of coalition that is then aimed at improving each, you know, member of that coalition's ability to serve youth. That's not specifically, you know, that's not individual level service for youth, but it benefits the service of youth as a whole. Um, and so that's, a, you know, the example of, you know, a solutions one. Um, so uh, again, if you know the the we we want to be you know um, it in that aspect, it comes down to uh, whether or not um, you're, you're able to report and collect um, individual level data. Um, so that again, there's this interplay between new programs and existing programs. You can be a new program and apply for the Youth Solutions Grant and report individual level data if you would like. Um, if you're a new program and uh, and you want to apply for youth promises because you believe you know it's uh, it, you're modeling something after an existing program just expanding to a different region, uh, you would be eligible for youth promise. You could you could take that. So again, just because you're it's new programming doesn't mean you automatically have to apply for youth solutions. It's just um, the area that would allow the capacity building. Um, the, uh, especially to, you know, potentially collect uh, data in a variety that would then make you eligible after that, this biennium to apply for the Youth Promise, because now you're an existing program, you've, you've, you've uh, been working with you to build capacity, you know, and, and grad, you know, move into the, to the Youth Promise. Something Thank I want to add in mind with some of these questions, a lot of it will also, and is kind of digging a little deeper is kind of depending on how you answer the questions in the RFA, you will be required to answer them. And I would look at the questions and then look at the rubric, because I think that may give you kind of a snapshot or a feel for, can I answer all these questions effectively? Just think of something to think about as you're going through this and asking some of these questions about, does my, my idea or my program fit within this? And can I convey this in a way that answers the questions, addresses all the bullets and also has the potential, according to what the rubric says, you know, have a high score. And just something to think about and keep that in mind as well. Thank you, Abe. Uh, Jared, I have a budget question. Uh, if we are requesting funds to attend a professional development conference, do we need to follow the federal per diem rates for lodging and meals? Um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I, I, I'm unsure, but I would imagine. Do you, well, Bill, about, I think we'll get back to you on that. I think we get to get the details on that specifically. Sounds um, good. Yeah, because yeah, it may also depend on uh, right the type of funding, right, in regards to as we mentioned, some of our funding, our Title Twenty funding, and some of oh. general funding. So some of that may play into it. So we'll get back to you on that question. All right. Thank you. Um, are program staff considered part of the admin costs? All right, say that again. Are program staff considered part of the admin costs? So I'm assuming by that question, it's probably direct program um, staff. Program, yeah, they would be included under personnel typically. If you're, yeah, if you're paying program staff, they would be personnel. Um, okay, another budget question. When we are filling out the budget worksheet, do you want us to include the total project budget or just the amount requested from YDD? as part of that, again, I'm assuming that that's part of the grant funds. 
Um, yeah, so the amount that you're requesting from YDD for that initiative, um, that will go in the amount requested at the top, and that should equal that total amount at the bottom. So the, yeah, the amount that you're requesting would be for that particular um, initiative or project. All right. Um, we got, we're right at 1130. We'll go ahead and maybe go for a couple more minutes to wrap up the questions that are towards the bottom of the chat. Um, and then uh, we will probably uh, have to answer the rest of the questions through the Q&A document. Um, if an organization has two programs that are similar in scope, but serve different communities, both location and demographic population, can they apply for the same initiative? Abe, yes. can you take that one? Perfect. Yeah. That's distinguishes um, different, different youth in a different place. Uh, there might be very similar programming with maybe some slight tweaks, I might imagine, just because they are in different locations, but yeah. All right. Um, so there is some a few questions about the system and moving back and forth. I think I can probably answer one of these. Uh, the system made us mark eligibility as complete before we can move to the other questions. And yes, the eligibility screener is the, the first required part, correct, Dave? Yes, you're correct. So you have, like I said, when you go in, you'll only see one task, your, el your first eligibility task. Now that one you can't go back and change because depending on how you answer those first questions on eligibility will determine your next set of questions based to your specific initiative, right? But once you once you've completed the first, you'll see your second. Once you complete the second, you'll be able to see task one, task two, and you'll be able to move back and forth. Again, there's kind of a hint here. You just need to fill out the fields, right, uh, to be able to maneuver, um, and just. Well, we made it so you had to fill out all the fields before you can move forward. The reason behind that is more for our grantees to make sure that they completely fill out and answer the questions. What we don't want to happen is for a grant applicant to skip forward, go back, fill in a answer a question, but may not answer it partially, go to the very end, submit it with a partially answered question that may hurt them. We kind of want to make put everyone kind of on go put and say, all right, but like I said, if you fill in the blanks or check off the boxes appropriately, you can move forward and back, right? But you have to complete it. But I strongly require, I strongly recommend you fill them in completely. All right, thank you, Abe. Um, so Jared, another regional question, just clarification, are regional awards by type of grant or is it one type of grant will be awarded per region? Um, so, so all of the community investment grants together, so the solutions, the promise, the uh, workforce, those are the initiatives, but they're, they're all community investment grants. So it would be one, uh, one grant at highest scoring application would be awarded per region. So that could be any of those, but, but yeah, so it's not each type, it's just one, um, that highest scoring application. And then the rest would move into that competitive pool and could also perhaps be awarded. But, but yeah, it's that highest of any of those different initiatives. Okay. And then another region question for you, Jared, is if we are performing an event uh, in one region but are serving populations from multiple regions, how would we capture that information? Um, how would we capture that information? Are you asking about data? I'm well, I'm, I'm kind of assuming the question would be, is what region would they be considered in if they're serving multiple regions? And if I'm, if I'm understanding the question correctly, I believe it's the, the region would be the, where the biggest population is being served, correct? Yeah, I think that's probably a case where you um, can petition to have your application counted where you're going to be serving the most youth. Yeah, I think it's dependent on where you're serving the majority of your youth. Now, we do understand sometimes based on depending where you're located in the state, you may serve youth that weren't originally in your scope just mm -hmm. because of whatever programming or the time of the year. Um, I know this happens in some of our rural areas during summer programming. They may get some youth from outer towns that weren't initially, right? And we know that happens. But uh, there is a mechanism when you go in and apply where you choose you know, where, where you're offering services primarily, and you can choose, you know, and it's based kind of on county. That's the way the maps divided up by the counties, and depending on which county will determine which region you're in, or counties will determine which region you're in, or serving youth. Thank you, and uh, Abe, yeah. kind of to that line. Oh, sorry, Bill. I was just gonna throw in real quick there. This is, this is, uh, sounds like a good example for why Youth Solutions was created. Um, 
because this may be a single event that, a, that an organization is asking uh, for our funds to help support. That single event may occur, say, in the Portland metro area, but it's serving you throughout the state, um, uh, which are going to come, you know, to the conference center to have this event. Um, so, as first of all, there'd be some questions around what kind of data is going to be able to be collected and submitted from that type of, of occurrence. Um, and then also, how would reporting work? Uh, for a, a biennial grant in that in that case, because it sounds like this is a one-off or an annual event. Um, and so that's really the solutions grant is where that type of flexibility is um, available. Um, it's gonna raise issues, say in Youth Promise, because it doesn't sound like service delivery occurs over the span of the biennium. And so that would be a question to, you know, again, this is just coming back to illustrate a distinction between a youth promise uh, and our other categories and, and youth solutions. All right, thank you, Bill. Um, so kind of along the same lines of the two programs, can you talk a little bit more uh, about if they can apply for the same initiative? So the question itself is, if an organization has two programs that are similar in scope but serve different communities, both location and demographic population, uh, can they s apply for this for the same initiative. So meaning, could, I'm, I'm assuming that would be, can they apply for the same initiative twice for the two separate locations? Yes. Uh, for example, you could have a workforce program in one part of the county and you can have a, the similar program somewhere else in the county, but serving a different set of, uh, a different youth population. So yeah, you have to be able to distinguish it though in your grant application, just be aware of that. All right. Thank you. Um, and just in recognition of time, we are a few minutes over. I recognize there are some questions that we are still getting to that were before the end of time or before the end of the 1130. Um, are you guys okay for a couple more minutes answering a few questions and then we'll cut it off at 1140? Yeah, I'm fine with that if everyone else is fine. All right. Um, so uh, some questions around how funding is gonna be allocated between the four categories. Uh, one of the previous responses that I, I put in there is that's still to be determined in terms of the exact funding for each um, initiative, correct, Abe? Yeah, that is a still, we're still awaiting some of that information. Okay. Um, we answered that. Are after school programs eligible for use solutions? Yes. Okay. All right. Uh, if you have a unique situation and aren't sure which initiative to apply for, who can we talk to on an individual level? After this presentation, you will have to reach out to the SPC. Uh, and then from there, uh, it'll kind of be determined, uh, depending on the question, you know, how it'll get answered. Perfect. Uh, and then Abe, um, is, is there a place within the application to upload letters of support? If well, yes, so, there is. how will support um, letters impact scoring? Excuse me, sorry. Yes, yeah, so that actually is optional. That's why it wasn't included. That will not be scored. Um, there is a space where it's an optional to upload letters of support intent to support, but keep in mind, uh, those will, those are not evaluated or used to score anything. Um, what they will probably be used again and will be around us after you've been executed the grant. It'll be more for internal uh, purposes. Perfect. Thank you. Um, and then um, I believe that we'll probably, I'm going to scan the rest, but I think we've answered most of the other questions. Do the narrative questions change based on which of the four categories is being applied for? For example, are the narrative questions slightly different for youth promise than for youth workforce? I can take that one, um, and the answer would be um, um, it. There, we do have some flexibility there, but uh, the the questions are type are, are general in nature to begin with. So it's really the answers that would change. Um, and so, for example, um, you know, report. Uh, please provide a, a you know a challenge, or please provide a success story. Obviously, those challenges are going to be. Um, you know, fo you know, like your response as a workforce program will detail kind of workforce related challenges is what, you know, is anticipated. Um, 
but there won't they're they're not nuanced enough to ask like specifically address the these things related to workforce um so so there may be a one uh one or two questions that are unique to the category that you're that you're in um but uh not necessarily all right thank you and i believe i am just answering one of the last questions and we are at 11 40. so Ava, i don't know if you want to close this out yeah uh first of all i just want to say thank you to the team who was on here as well as molly behind the scenes who's helping with this and thank you to all of you who were on this call and were able to be present with us and uh, i just want to say thank you for all the good work you're doing and will be doing and continue to be doing um, again if you have any questions please feel free to reach out to our spc noemi rios it's on the first page of the rfa and uh, best of luck to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll go ahead and end the seminar here in just a few moments. Well, oh, thanks, Brian. I didn't know you saw the call. Awesome. Thank you.